This is Plate Mark. My name is Ann Schaefer and I am your host. You have found the second part of our conversation with the High Priestess of Mesotent, Carol Wax. This is the continuation of a conversation we started last time. It goes on for another, you know, 50 minutes or something, but we're going to get into her work and other artists who work in Mesotent in this part and probably still some history thrown in there because we talked about all sorts of things all at once. If you enjoy Platemark and if you appreciate the content we're producing, please consider going over to platemarkpodcast.com and hitting the support and donate button. Your support would be most appreciated. And also, just to reiterate the, my housekeeping blurb at the top of every episode, I identify as a cishet white woman and I use the pronouns she, her. I record Platemark in Baltimore, Maryland, the land of the Piscataway Conway people. Images will be over on the show notes at platemarkpodcast.com. I think you know that. And um, I think that's probably it. Yeah. Buckle up. Let's get rolling. When printmakers come to me and they say, how do I make prints now? I'm out of art school. I said, join a communal workshop. You will learn so much. So much information will come through your hands, through observation, more than in school. It's a great way to pass on information. And uh, I think information is power and inspiration. Yes, knowledge is power. <laughs> Completely. It's the small town mentality of a print shop. I mean, it's just the kinds of things that you absorb from each other. I always tell my students when we do critique, it's, it's the hive mind because each one of them is finding a different way to solve something. You know, you give them the basic roadmap, but everybody finds a different way. And, and it's astonishing how many variations there could be. You get 50 printmakers in a room and you're going to get 50 different ways to do it, you know? <laughs> so it's, yeah, it's, and, it, and it's wonderful to have all that because if one way doesn't work, then the other way will. And, and you know, as Andrew Raftery, best printmaker there is, you know, I was like, you know, he says 50% of printmaking is about solving problems. There's always something to come. I mean, what inspired me to write the book was a problem. I had done a print called Singer One, and it, I had gotten the piece of copper um, scrap from Deli Soft Gelato. And it was like carving a hot knife through butter. This was the most beautiful piece of copper. Fantastic. The next one was Singer 2. I had gotten that copper from David Finkbeiner. He said, it's been sitting in my studio for years. I don't know where it came from. And I immediately noticed there was a difference in rocking this plate. I was getting copper dust everywhere. I was like, what the hell is this? And when I, I used the same rocking pattern, same rocker, same everything. When I went to try and scrape and burnish, the plate responded differently to the, to the burnisher than the other plate did. And it was like I lost control of all my, my tonal values. I lost the whole inside rectangle of the image, and, and I didn't know what to do. So I had to find a way to reground, use a different ground, use different tools, and in solving that problem, I created a print that was better than it would have been otherwise because I was contrasting grounds and effects. And it taught me that copper is not just copper. I went to the uh, graphic center. I said, anybody know anything about copper? Ah, copper's copper. No, there's tremendous range of copper. It's brittle, tensile, hard, soft, you know, all these different things. And so when I went to get the plate steel face, I went to Deli Sacciolato, who was facing my plates at that time. He was still in New York, half in Florida. And I asked him about this. He goes, wow, you have a lot of information here now. Maybe we should write a book together. I want to write another book and blah, blah, blah. And, but he moved to Florida. And I was like, well, I'll write the book. So that's how the book came about. Cool. That's the same Sacciolato of the complete printmaker, which had, right? It came out about 1990. And it was like the Bible. Yeah. I still yeah. have my copy, and it's in pieces. Oh, yeah, mine too. Yeah. <laughs> in fact, it's really funny. When, when I first published uh, The Mezzotin, people said, you know, you should put it in a spiral so that people can lay it flat, you know, in the studio. But, you know, no library is going to uh, buy it then, so. That's why I had the paperback of the first one, but that's why I have the hardback of the new one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, and they did such a great job. I was, I mean, when I got it, it was really funny. Um, my hot water heater broke. The plumber came and he, he put in a tankless heater, which I love. It's got beautiful copper and brass pipes everywhere, which I, I'm, of course I'm in love with. And as he's leaving, he said, you know, there's a package for you here. I went, huh? And so um, I opened it up and there's a, a bottle of wine and the first copy of the book. And I was just like, oh, 
They did a great job. They really did Schiffer Pop. Fantastic. <laughs> I had no idea really what, um, how it was going to feel, how, how it was going to look or anything until it was there. It was all on the screen. So you didn't even get to feel the paper. <laughs> no, and I had written, I said, what kind of paper are you going to use? Like, like, like <laughs> the name of the paper. But it's a little heavier weight than the, the Abrams edition. The, the, it's really heavy. And they, you know, allowed me to change all these illustrations and add all the new artists. And it smells great, too. Everybody should know just how marvelous. <laughs> just like any good new print, it smells fantastic. <laughs> I don't smell it. I don't know about any other people, but, you know, periodically, no, not period. Anytime I get a new book, you instantly, like with the old mimeograph copies, you know, you instantly go and smell the book. And oh, okay. honestly, my students. Yeah, you get a little high. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, and anytime I'm holding a student's print for a critique and I'm. <sighs> <laughs> and, and inks have different fragrances too. For instance, my favorite uh, relief print ink has got a far sexier smell than the one they're using in the print shop. It's well, a lot of people are kind of taken aback. Um, they'll say, "What kind of paper is this?" Or you know, "Can I use this?" Or whatever. And I'll take a corner of it and I'll put it in my mouth. And they're saying, "Are you tasting it? What are you doing?" I said, "No, I'm a little bit of spit to see how fast it softens, so I know how how much sizing's in it." And they're like, ah, you know, and, it, and it's just something I sort of came up with, um, but I'm pretty accurate with it. So, uh, you know, it's just a corner and it's just a little bit of spit. But And that's the part that takes printmaking back to the marvelous manual handedness of, of it, you know. Just, it's just even the, you know, how, are my prints completely dry? Well, I put it against my face, and if it's cool, then it's still some latent moisture in there. John Sparks, the founder of the print department, used to walk in on the first day of litho class, and he'd have a green stone in front of him, and he'd walk in, and he'd take his nose, and he'd go, and he goes, and put it across the stone. That'll print! And they're all just astonished. Uh, because it still boils down to the Degas. They called it the cookery of art. It is, it's just magical though. It is all problem solving and who gets to add how much parsley to the garnish to the, you know, it's amazing. Well, you know, it's funny you bring up John Sparks. Um, when I went up to Lake Placid for my very first printmaking class, John Sparks was my litho teacher. Get but out. I'm serious. No kidding. Really. And it was a great wow. fight. Um, and uh, Nancy Grieb, she was my intaglio teacher. They brought up uh, Krishna Reddy to give demos with viscosity printing. So I learned that. I learned a lot about ink. And Bob Blackburn was with him. So that was my first encounter with Bob Blackburn. And just the nicest, nicest man. Terrible with money. But nicest, wonderful, creative soul. You know? So very fun. Bob. When you ink a me mesotint plate, is it hard? Like the wiping across the fine sandpaper, do you, do you have to treat it differently than you do a line etch line engraving? Most definitely. I'm better at printing mesotint than I am printing a line etching. I start with a tarlatan and there's a tremendous amount of drag on the plate. I mean, your arm is sore after two seconds. And you can be pretty free at first. You can just drag that ink right off, you know, like just suck it off. And then after that, you can be more careful. Uh, and I, I don't use very coarse tarlatans. They can be abrasive on the plate, depending on the ground. So I use softer tarlatans, not cheesecloth or anything like that. And then the hand wiping is important. And the thing about mesotint is that you're raising the surface of the plate. So when you carve a white line, it's here's your burrs and here's your white line. <laughs> you know, it, the ink says, oh, an intaglio line. I'm going to print black. No amount of surface wiping, like say paper wipe, which I hate, will get rid of that because you, you're only hitting the tops of the burrs. So you have to take, like I take like the corner of a mat board chip and you have to drag that ink out. Now, obviously you have to do uh, the plate work and get as much of the burr out as you can. But at a certain point, you can't. So you will drag it out with either a toothpick or, uh, you know, a, the corner of a, of a piece of cardboard, or there'll be a sm slight dip like this, and you go in with your finger with a little, maybe with a little bit of mag on it or something. Um, so again, you have to, you have to compensate for that topography of the plate. And so printing a mesotin plate, you have to educate someone. I mean, if you're working with a printer, 
I had to educate Jennifer about it. And she became phenomenal. It is different. And uh, you never paper wipe. I don't like paper wiping any kind of dry pull. Uh, always with the hand and the fingers. And um, it's very tactile. And um, yeah, it, 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 it's, it's similar, but it's it, a lot of differences. And during the history, when I was reading about this, they were using special little sticks to pull the ink out and... Um, they had problems with this printer fucked up the plate, you know, and sorry, they, and they, you know, and they had to educate them how to, how to, how to um, print. So this has been an ongoing issue. So the other issue is what people don't understand. And I see this online all the time. People who are starting with mezzotins are, are posting, oh, look what I did. Look what I did. Look what I did. And it's like, even online, I can see they did not do the plate work. They did not go far enough down in the ground, and they're compensating by overwiping the plate, and they're just wiping the blacks. They're not getting down to the whites and the light grays. And so, the, you know, it's, it's a, a real misconception about how to, how to print these plates. And uh, I like to leave a little juiciness in the dark grays, and I don't want to overwipe. So, you know, I'll go in and selectively wipe if I have to. And then you get someone like John Martin, Apocalypse Martin from the, you know, 19th century. Uh, yeah, 19th century. And he, um, he would actually, to compensate for the very shallow grounds on these, on the, he was working on steel, sometimes use up to eight different black inks to compensate for um, sometimes in a, in a very shallow ground, your light grays will look very dry and washed out. When you say eight different inks, are you talking within the same uh, impression? Like yes, within a la the, the same huh. plate. And so he would have all these assistants and everybody would, you know, he had a, like a whole like factory going, selectively wiping the different inks with the different viscosities, the different pigments and all of that on one plate to increase the range of lighting effects. That's pretty wonderfully arcane and exciting <laughs> chunk of news. Frankly. Yeah, I'm going to have to go look at some. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Can you tell when yeah. you're looking at them? No, it's seamless. It's, it's beautiful. Yeah. We it's have a, a copy of uh, John Martin's uh, illustrations for Paradise Lost at the Peabody Library, and I've lived in that book, and now I'm going to have to go back and visit it again. Well, and we're just... talking mostly the big plates. I mean, he had these huge plates. Oh, the big ones. Okay. Now, you know, all these apocalyptic scenes with tons of people and the light coming down and, you know, um, you know, it, it was, it was, uh, they're huge. And he's printing these on these old presses. It's very impressive what he could do. And then, of course, he fell out of favor. What's also, you know, so inspiring to me and, uh, no, okay, and reassuring to me <laughs> was like, you know, everybody has their day. I look at someone like Valentin Green and John Raphael Smith, probably the two greatest mezzotinted engravers who ever lived. Both died in poverty, uh, <laughs> kind of bankrupt. And it, it's really kind of interesting that, um, you know, you think you've hit the, the pinnacle of, of your, you know, maybe you're the biggest expert in the field in this arcane medium. And, and it's like, okay, how do I pay the rent? <laughs> so... Well, it didn't go too well for Gutenberg either. So I guess it's another one of those lovely traditions in printmaking. Huh? And yet everyone's heard of him. So. Carol, yeah. you haven't mentioned my favorite mezzotinter, Richard Earlham. <gasps> well, the great thing about Earlham, I mean, is that how flexible he was, that he could handle still life, he could handle portraiture, he could do landscape, he could do anything. And he, I think he started out apprentice to a coach decorator, I think, if I'm not mistaken. So, um, you know, he, he had that facility to paint, and, but he went into mezzotint. And, you know, the very first time I looked at his print of uh, the market thing where, with the meats and the birds and everything all over, there's this swan and the breast is just exposed there in the middle. And it, you really want to touch it and go, oh, my God, there's like feathers. And it's, it's, it's really amazing what he could do. And the fruit and flower pieces. And so he would, he would etch the plates you know, and then mezzotint over. And so as you scrape back, the lines emerge. And not only just because it's easier to do that than to scrape around with little veins and a leaf, but because it adds texture. And so what happens is you etch and you etch deeper than the mezzotint ground. So the etched intaglio lines down here and the mezzotints on top. 
So when it's printed, it flips, and the mezzotint's here, the etching sits on top. And to keep that texture, they wouldn't flatten the prints immediately. They would let them air dry and let the, the ink set. Then they would re-blot them, put them in blotters, and flatten them because they wanted to keep that three-dimensional texture. If you look at some of the uh, Liber Studiorums, so JMW Turner worked with several mezzotint flavors, and you look at them, some of them, the ones that he worked on with Charles Turner, no relation, um, were etched so deeply that the prints look like this brown string sitting on top of the paper. And all of that textural thing, I mean, now um, one of my beefs, even though the prints are gorgeous, that some of these people are doing um, now, it, they want it to look like a photograph. And that to me is very flat. Whereas they're not using the textural qualities of mesotint as much. Uh, contrasting grounds, uh, combining with urine engraving or etching or you know even aquatone. Um, there's very few people doing that. You know, one of the highlights when we'd get to that moment uh, when Anne and I were teaching history of prints together was when we'd pull out the Earlums and we actually had the benefit of having the line etch and I believe we had a middle state but and then the final state and it's, you know, having 20 people just go, oh, <laughs> it was just, you know, it's a knee buckler. It was just so magnificent and was also just wonderful to really see how that line is so important to the next phase of adding the, 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 all of the textures and the values. It was always so much fun. Those flower pieces. Ugh. The other thing is, Carol, I, slightly later in the century after Turner, you get the mezzotinters affecting the watercolors that were being produced. Like, I feel like there was a Thomas Lupton after one of the Girton watercolors of the White House on the bank. And I mean, it's just so delicate and wafty and I see it in blues and whites and it's just this gray. And I mean, it's just insane how deft they well, became. These guys like Girton and, and Turner, when they were young artists starting out, their job was working with John Raffles Smith in his mezzotint studio. They were watercoloring prints. And so then you get these later Turner paintings that have no outlines, no nothing. It was just atmospheric effects. And if you, if you took the technique that you used to watercolor mezzotints, took away the mezzotint, you would have these later oil paintings by Turner. And so obviously, um, James W. Turner working for John Raphael Smith had a huge impact later on in his what he was doing. And of course, Turner also was capable because of this exposure of making mezzotints. When he died, they found all these copper and steel plates of nothing but atmospheric effects done in mezzotint. And they printed them as a little Lieber Studiorum post death. And um, what do they call that? What it's called. <laughs> and, um, and so, you know, obviously, Printmaking and mezzotint in particular had a profound effect on Turner as an artist, as a painter. And people don't, you know, really understand. I mean, I now mostly am working with gouache paint. I, I've done oil paint and watercolor and blah, blah. But most of my recent work um, has been in gouache, working on Reeves BFK tan paper. So, and I'm working that gouache into the fibers. I love paper. But my mezzotint background informs my paintings incredibly. I would be a different painter now if I, if I hadn't done Mesotin. And John Raphael Smith was an excellent painter. He uh, did beautiful pastels. So, you know, a lot of these artists, uh, these engravers from back then were, were very capable artists, but they couldn't make a living at it. They were known for certain things. And someone like James Ward, um, you know, William Ward and James Ward worked for John Raphael Smith. Um, and nobody wanted James Ward to become a painter because they didn't want the competition, but they also wanted his engraving services. So he would engrave at night and sign William instead of James Ward just to make the money. And then, of course, he did become recognized and a member of the Academy, I believe, um, as a painter. So, you know, I feel like James Ward sometimes. No one recognizes my paintings. And, uh, and yet... Uh, I've done more paintings probably than prints and drawings, uh, tons of drawings. If you go to my website, there's probably more paintings there than, than prints. Carol, on your own website, 
you have your work. And then where can people buy your work? You're with several galleries, right? Uh, my prints are available through Conrad Graber Fine Art down in Baltimore. Child's Gallery has some. The, the gallery at the Met Store, Metropolitan Museum of Art, um, they do wonderfully with my work. Sam Davidson has had it for oh, just like, I don't know, 35 years or something. And um, then uh, Earl Retief of Stone and Press Galleries, they still have work that they're selling. So, okay. you know, a lot of people have just moved to more of an online venue. Um, so, but oh, who else? I got one from Childs. I got two from Childs. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and and um, <laughs> they're down in Baltimore. I don't know why you didn't buy from Conrad. Um, I and, did. Oh, okay. <laughs> but at the print fair in New York. Right. So go figure. Good to know. But um, uh, Simon Garvey has some of my paintings, uh, just one, one series. I, I started a series where I'm painting on old atlases. I, I ripped the maps out of the atlas and um, do some gouache paintings on top of that. And they have that series. But right now, I do not have um, more extensive representation for these paintings. And I have a lot of them. And a lot of mixed media stuff where I'll uh, you know, work on uh, Strathmore, Bristol paper, with pencil, and go in with colored pencils and watercolor and whatever. So for me, all the different mixtures of, of techniques, one flows into the other. And if I hadn't been making art for a while, which I couldn't really do anything for a year while I was taking care of my mother, um, you know, I, I always go back. I start with a drawing. And for me, having an ebony pencil or, a, you know, black wing pencil in my hand, that's it. You know, I'm home. Can anyway. we talk about the trajectory of your subject matter? I'm, we're going to focus on the mezzotints because this is a print podcast. <laughs> but <laughs> noted about the gouache drawings and watercolors, uh, sort of watercolors, opaque watercolors. So, but let's talk about like where where you started with the mezzotints way back in the day. Did you focus on the machinery immediately? What? Well, you know, again, I was one of these people who was influenced by Hamaguchi. I had no clue that there was a 350 year history of portraiture or anything else in mezzotint, clueless. And so all I knew was these Japanese prints and some, some Avadi, Mario Avadi. And so I started with still life. My first mezzotint that I signed was very Hamaguchi-like. It was uh, 11 spiral shells. And of course, that's a shell that Hamaguchi used a lot. And um, because it's very, very hard to engrave consistently, um, scrape, burnish consistently long gradations in mezzotint because you're, and also you're having to judge the reflections of the light and all, all that. Very difficult to do that. Um, those are the hardest things to do. I found it easier to start with small modular kind of, uh, motifs like the shell of the spiral and scrape and burnish those. They were very short distance between the highlight and the black. And so I went from shells to doing string. I do uh, like the, the, the print that's on the cover of the first edition, the old clothesline. But eventually I started to branch out and remove more of the background and play with the shadows. Then one summer, my parents went away on vacation. I was living in Flushing, Queens, and it was hot. I was living on the top floor of this brick building. It was like a brick oven with a tar roof. And I, I said, okay, well, I'm just going up to their house and I'll just, you know, stay there for a week till this heat wave is over. And I puttered around the basement where it was cool and there was this old fan. And I said, oh, this is kind of cool. And I put it on the floor and the light behind it was a single little bulb. made this shadow all over the place. And I was like, oh, ooh. And so I did this print called Fanfare. So... I did this print and I was never really happy with it because I felt I didn't have control over the way I took out the background. Um, but it sold out very quickly and I was like, wow. But that got me very much interested in the repeated patterns in a different way because the shadows I noticed, which were very flat in that, create an animation. And so I see these machines as having an inner life. Through repetition, I, I could project that idea of animation like an anima, a soul in these, these objects. And, and it's true that the per people who make them, their, their imprint is on these machines, their aesthetic. Then I 
started in with the microscopes and the sewing machines. And like with Singer One, for me, it wasn't about the sewing machine. It was about light sculpted and framed by a sewing machine. And so I was, in the beginning, very much involved with using these machines to explore how light and shadow affect our, our perceptions of form, volume, and depth. I was sort of very clinical about it at the beginning, um, not so involved in their inner lives as much as I did become. That's how the machinery developed, and I have a fascination with it. Also, there is this idea of repeated patterns, because if a typewriter has these keys, and they're not all the same, and the, the light doesn't hit them all the same. And then while I was writing the book, I worked with Philip Perlstein, the artist Philip Perlstein. Huge influence on my life. Um, he was an amazing person, as well as an amazing artist. The way his figures zoomed in and out of the picture plane, and the conversations we had. I mean, I was, I can't say enough good things about Philip Perlstein. And what, however you feel about his art, I don't care. But working with him, I would watch how he worked and how he controlled the light, how he shaped the light. And I realized there was so much more to shadows, that they had an outer edge that was darker and an inner edge that was a little lighter and, 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 you know, that they weren't flat black things. I learned a lot about it and that made me able to use shadows as a tool. So there are times where I have an object set up um, and I see how the shadows kind of go but they don't go the way I want them to. And I'm able to, because I understand how light interacts with solids, use the light as a tool. And so I can change it. That was very important when I didn't have to be reliant on either a photograph or what I saw. I, I like working from life. I will work from a photograph if I have to, um, but I like working from life because I have no sense of perspective. And so my perspective is very warped and it, I, I stretch things and I, I push things into the background. I, I, I change whatever I need. The Singer One sewing machine, you would never get that perspective with a camera. I had my eye right up against the opening in the wheel to get the, the focus on the needle, but yet you see the whole wheel. And then, of course, stretching it this way to fit on, on the plate. Working from life is very important for me. Otherwise, it flattens my work. Question. Um, when you say, I have no perspective, is that an ocular uh, situation that's unique to you? Or is it the way you prefer to do your work? Um, no, I just have no education in true perspective and how to do three-point or two-point, whatever it is, perspective. I just, I've just never really been taught. But it's very curious. Um, when I was in Greece, I had two solo shows in Greece at the Heracleidon Museum that Paul Firos established. And thank you very much, Paul. And so he brought me over to Greece and he said, well, take this trolley car up to the top of this mountain and you'll see all of Athens. You know, it's like, and I never did it. And I realized I have no interest in seeing things far away. I like seeing things close up. And I think that's one of the reasons people react strangely to my work um, is because my work is right there in the front of the picture plane. It's confrontational. And, and people back off. It doesn't draw you in that much. And whereas, you know, someone who might do, you know, figures far away, you're drawn and go, who's that back there? You know, so um, I think that's how some people react to my work. The fact that it's very bold. It's uh, a lot of, uh, you know, stark lighting. And the fact that it's, it's right up there coming at you. I think that is part of my creative DNA, as Twyla Tharp would call it. So um, uh, that was a very good book to read, by the way. She did this book about creativity. It was fantastic. She's very articulate. Oh, yeah, it's a great book. Yeah. It's a great yeah. book. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. And, uh, yeah, and the more you can read about other people's creative processes, boy, it's, it's interesting what you can... Uh, you say, oh, yeah, I don't, I don't get that, but I get that. And, and having more uh, creative consciousness about your own process, I think it can, you know, get you out of uh, creative dead ends. When you, everybody hits a creative dead end like, at a certain point, you know, like, oh, I just don't feel it, you know. But having, having that facility to uh, articulate what's going on um, can be very useful. You get, you know, back out, back the truck out. And, and of course, like what Chuck Close used to say is just show up. You know, you don't wait for that inspiration. Just, you know, 
Take out a piece of paper and do something and something will come of it. Move your hands. I was teaching at RISD, the students were like, you know, well, I had a lot of creative ideas before you gave me, filled my head with all this information. I'm like, you have just this much room for information? <laughs> <laughs> Periodically, I'll say, it's okay to use your mind. There's more where that came from. You won't use it up. You start making a list after decades <laughs> of teaching, you know, stupid things students have said that you'll never forget. So that was one of them. At some point, you started doing your dog with the draped, striped cloth, which mm -hmm. seemed like a real departure from the fan. And but it's not really because it's the cloth no, is it's your. Got, it's got the repeated patterns still that modulate. People think of me as a realist, um, but I'm not. I'm, I'm, I, I paint and draw representationally, great. But I'm not really a realist, but I have a very cartoony style that exaggerates organic forms. For me, the, the machinery and the textiles are, are one and the same almost. And how that came about was uh, I had a Weimar honor, Cecil, who, don't make me cry, I still cry. <laughs> Six years gone, exactly, and I'm, I'm still not over oh. it. And, um, you know, she, she, she loved to be swaddled. And she would move around under the blanket like a Martha Graham dancer. And it, it, it became, you know, really interesting to watch. And so, you know, I, I uh, ended up, um, you know, swaddling her in fabric. And I did have to work in large part from photographs and my imagination. A lot of imagination goes into these scenes. Nothing's literal, nothing. Um, and so I, you know, I started that. I originally had planned to do four images. Uh, I did two. And now I have a, a dog a new dog. We've had her like nine, nine or 10 weeks or something. Delia, she's a delight. And I already have ideas to use her. Um, so I said, how, you know, I say to her, I'd like to be immortalized. <laughs> she's like, you know, are there Aww. treats involved? <laughs> you know, is it another um, Weimar on her? No, we don't know what she is. Um, she looks almost like she could be a Italian greyhound mixed with a pointer or something. She's uh, almost black, but with beautiful umber undertones and um, a white chest and all white feet. And she's just she's just very soft, short fur, which you need around here because the ticks, you have to find them. And uh, oh. she's, she's just lovely. So I'm in love. <laughs> We're in love. Oh. Falling in love again. <laughs> yes. That's very <laughs> sweet. All right. So bring us up to... To today, how, what are you what are you working on now, and what's coming up in the future now that the book is done? Right. Well, I started getting back into making art because again, the whole year taking my mother, I, I couldn't do anything, and so I've done a, a drawing, I've done a couple of paintings. I just started a mezzotint uh, of an old telephone, um, and with a new twist, <laughs> and and you know, a lot of times I'm inspired by the copper I have here. And so I'll take out a piece of copper and I get from different sources and I'll say, oh, I have this object here and then I'll, you know, I can sort of fit it into this plate and how would I do it? Uh, what would make it, you know, something other than just a representation of a telephone? What, what else is there? Um, what else can I say with it? And this cage that I made to hide my cardboard that I carved out of my studio was sort of a dead area as far as light anyway. One whole wall is all my resource books, but what you don't see on the other side is shelves, lots of shelves full of all these objects that I live with. Thinking, what can I do? You know, I look at something and I've lived with it long enough that I go, I'll take that one off the shelf and play with it. And, you know, works, doesn't work, or I'll try another one. It's funny, my boyfriend will say, well, you can have some stuff you can throw out. And I go, well, what am I going to draw? <laughs> you know? And... Um, <laughs> So, uh, so I have all this stuff and, you know, so I have the heart of a minimalist and I have the studio of, but as long as everything's organized. And of course now a lot of things have to be protected because Delia has a taste for paper and, uh, she fell in love with Gabe Peterdy and Will Barnett, but not in the way I would have liked. And so I had to block off the books on the bottom shelf and <laughs> it's a nibble. <laughs> it got her in time. So, um, you know, so the, everything's organized and, um, you know, I'm always looking for new objects. Um, I have this 
policy where if someone gives me or lends me an object that ends up in a print, they get a free print. So if anyone has any, you know, I'm looking at the press behind you. I, I think I might have some things for you. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, do you. <laughs> do you think Chris will miss any of them? No. <laughs> It almost justifies the pulley that I got for 10 bucks off of Facebook Marketplace uh, last weekend. It, it's just gorgeous. It's completely pulley. weathered wood and, you know, a corroded metal. And it's just beautiful. Yeah, I have, I have quite a few of those and I still haven't figured out how to use them. There's one that appeared in one of my paintings. But other than that, I haven't figured out yet. And then when I revisit objects, uh, it's really interesting to see like when I did Remington Noiseless, the first typewriter print I did, very right up front, light, um, uh, stylized, very stylized light. When I did Remington Return, same typewriter from the side, um, it's all about the shadows. And that was after working for Philip. And so it was interesting that that typewriter, there's no depth at all. It's a flat surface. The only thing that tells you there is depth there is the shadow work that you associate with a three-dimensional object. Your mind's filling in the work. That's the one that the Met owns, is Remington Return. Oh, and speaking of the Met, so um, I also use my printmaking skills to have fun every once in a while. Uh, I've done Buren engravings of Cecil, my, my Weimaraner, but um, every year I do a solstice print, and it's a deep-etched print that I print in relief like a wood cut, like relief, you know, lino linoleum cut or something. So in, in 2016, the Met commissioned me to do four images done that way for them. If they could sell and they sell them, Laura Einstein sells them in the Met store. They still have the editions, they're limited editions. But um, last year they decided they would reproduce them as holiday cards and they are now available. They say glad tidings, so it's totally non-sectarian. If your friends are Jewish, Muslim, Christian, doesn't matter, you know, Baha'i, whatever, um, you can mail them out and say, hello, how are you doing? I, I think it's, you know, important to do that. Um, I always, you know, people say, oh, art touches people. The one proof I had that art really did touch people was the year of the World Trade Center disaster. Um, I just didn't have it in me to make. I said, how can I send out, you know, happy holiday card or whatever? We call them solstice cards. But I did a print of the missing World Trade Centers as the legs of deer that they're weeping and the stars are weeping, but there's also hope in them with those stars and everything. And what was interesting to me was that that it touched so many people that I realized, well, maybe art really does have the ability to... Um, um, give people hope, you know? We're in a society where we're just inundated with visual images all the time. Our phones, everywhere you go, we're swamped by it. And we, we really don't take the time to uh, consider art as much as we used to, I think. Um, you know, it used to be come up and see my etchings, come see my portfolio of, you know, prints. And that never happens ever <laughs> anymore. I think that, you know, of course, society has changed so much that we don't uh, we don't take the time, and, and and also art always seems to be people getting bigger and bigger and bigger to be important. It has to be bigger, and I'm like, well, yeah, but look at Vermeer, all little teeny tiny things, and everybody loves Vermeer. They're drawn into their world, and what my my more recent work is um, smaller. The paintings are fairly small, and the prints, of course, don't, aren't that big anymore, and um, you know, that draws you into a world that is small, but makes a larger statement. Uh, there's underlying subtext now, more and more politically, socially narratives, psychological narratives implied in my work now that uh, are coming out because I'm using more and more objects. Like we look at an object and maybe it's an icon of industrial debris or something. But when you combine objects, they form a narrative between them and tell a story. And so you can manipulate that um, to tell, you know, whatever's going on. Some of my work has this clown puppet that um, we had as children, and that I use that as the fool. And in my paintings, it sort of represents uh, Trump um, in a lot of my paintings. And so uh, <laughs> things like that come up, you know, fortune's fool, and he's being eaten by, a, you know, chopsticks, you know.
There's a lot of uh, subtext in there that I draw people into my tiny little world. And it, you know, it's, it sort of dates back to childhood when you're playing with the stuff you have. We didn't have a Ken doll, so we took the you know, head off the Ringo doll, put it on the Barbie doll, blah, blah. And you, know, you, you would use your imagination. Um, it wasn't spelled out for us. We did whatever we wanted. And I still do that when I, I arrange these dioramas in my studio. You know, put the puppet here and the chopsticks, and I use these, uh, you know, articulated hand models, you know, that students learn to draw hands from. Um, and, you know, that is appearing in the uh, last three or four years. So many of my paintings, I'm fascinated by these things. Anything to do with automatons, I know. Huh. Makes sense. With the, um, the stark, you know, light, dark, Lighting parts, it, uh, it always strikes me as being super filmic and, yeah. 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 Very noir. Yeah. Well, I just read And I wonder if you're a, a fan watcher. Noir. Oh, God, yes. I mean, and the thing is, you know, even as a kid, I was a, okay, a little strange child, I admit. But what I would do is I would look at these, you know, like the Maltese Falcon or Casablanca. And when you look at, you know, you have Mary Astor and you have Bogart and all these, and, they, and they're lined up, and Peter Lorre, so that one guy's wearing gray, she's wearing the lace, and then the two guys with the black suits are separate. Because otherwise, the two black suits meld into each other. And then the background, there's a certain, you know, aesthetic to the background so that that doesn't interfere. So it's all about the relative tonal values in those movies. And then you look at Casablanca, Rick's Cafe, is all defined by the light and the palm frond shadows and the shadows of the Moroccan screens. And um, that's what creates the space. And I was acutely aware of that as a child. That's how weird I was. So when I began working in black and white, it was very easy for me to carve light out of um, darkness. And um, what was interesting was Philip used to, Philip Preston always used to say to me, Printmaking is hard, painting's easy. And I used to, you know, I was so intimidated by painting, but he convinced me to try painting. And um, what was interesting was that when I started to paint, you could have a light green and a light blue together and they read differently. If you were to convert that to black and white, it's gray and gray and they're the same value. And so all of a sudden, when I started realizing how freeing that was, it was an explosion of work. And then, and there's still a dialogue between my paintings and my prints that is very, very essential to me. But it all stems from the prints. I would be a different painter without the printmaking. And I think in layers. There was one time I was stuck on a drawing that became a vitriograph. I worked with uh, Harvey Littleton down in North Carolina to do these, this huge print from glass plates. When I was working on the drawing in preparation, I was kind of stuck. It was a big sewing machine from the side. I didn't know what to do with the background. The shadows didn't look right. And so I was kind of stuck. And I was friends with Chuck Close. I called him up. I said, Chuck, I'm stuck. So he said, come on over for lunch. We had Putinesca sauce on some kind of thing. It was delicious. And, um, and the whole time I'm talking to him, I'm looking at this painting that he's unfinished on the wall. I think it was, uh, God, I can't remember. Um, I, I'm drawing blank on the, on the artist, but in any case, I was black and white. And as I'm watching this painting, I felt like I was descending through screens of layers. And I didn't know at the time that Chuck thought in terms of layers. So I was somehow experiencing by seeing this unfinished work, um, the, 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 what was happening in a way that I wouldn't have otherwise. And um, I came home and I said, what the, was that experience? What was that? Like, like Alice in Wonderland going through the you know, rabbit hole. And I realized layers. And so that, that experience, I said, let me add a fake wallpaper. I made up a wallpaper pattern behind the shadows. And that got me working more and more and more and more into color. And then I got to the point where I couldn't do in color with pencil what I wanted. So... Um, I applied to the Marie Wall Sharp Foundation and got a free studio in Tribeca for a year when they were down there. And that's when I started to paint and to use pastel. That all informed my art. And it was just, it was an amazing experience. I, it was one of the most prolific years of my life. Yeah, I was able to vomit out a lot of work. <laughs> it just, it's just coming out of me. 
the noir bit. Um, it's, it, Sydney Green Street, by the way, Maltese Falcon, Casablanca. I absolutely gobbled those up at Varsity Theater. I was like 11 or 12, and I just sit there all day Saturday and looking at just living in that huge world of black and white. It was absolute. I it always makes sense of you and Noir. It's, I don't know if that's that weird, Carol, or maybe it's just that we're both weird. No, I mean, you know, for me, Are you know, I really relate to it. It really affected yeah, me. Yeah, absolutely. How annoyed were you when um, Ted Turner started colorizing things? I was like, why <laughs> do you do this? Exactly. Right, go back to the Mesotins. You look at these Mesotins and people still, to this day, you could, you could buy a black and white Mesotin and have someone color it. I mean, why would anyone do that? You know, what was so amazing about these mezzotint engravers back then, they were working from, you know, sometimes from black and white drawings that someone would make of a painting, but they weren't copyists. They were translators. They would translate what was in color into black and white. And there are many times I've seen the painting after, you know, years and years of seeing the prints um, and looked at the painting and went, eh. <laughs> you know, the print was so much better. The print had so much more to offer me. And <laughs> so, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, color can be a crutch. And I used to tell my students, don't use color as a crutch. But it can also be, you know, very freeing. But mezzotint, you know, with the film noir and the mezzotint teaches you about value. Uh, I don't mean that, what something costs. I mean, you know, you know, uh, relative tonal values, you know, what, when students, students ask, what's that? I say contrast, okay? Um, but it's more than that. And the, these guys were amazing, these 18th century guys. There are times I've, I've, I've been sitting, raving something, thinking, okay, what would John Raphael Smith do? I'm not sure that that T-shirt would be an all-time big seller, but <laughs> what would no. I don't think they could print it properly. <laughs> No, but you know, Fred, Fred Mershimer is like one of my closest friends, and I don't, I don't even think I could get through this world without Fred. Um, you know, he's and he's just an amazing, amazing printmaker, and um, you know, I, I really value his friendship and and being able to bounce ideas off him in ways that I can't with anyone else. We have this way of knowing you know, what the problem is. Um, I said, well, Fred, what do you think I should do about blah, blah? They're like, and then, of course, a lot of times he says, well, why should I tell you? You always do the opposite. I said, yeah, but I want you to input. He's a, an amazing friend, an amazing artist. I can't say enough good about him. And he was very generous in giving me images. I've never met Fred. And No. Really? He's around. Yeah. But, um, no, he, he, there's so much of his work in, in, in the book now because he was very generous about giving me state proofs you know, there's this short story about the mezzotint, uh, about mezzotint where a figure moves in and out of the print. You know, you could alter mezzotint so easily that that became a thing. And so there's a very famous short story. And his technique is so phenomenal that he can move figures around in a picture plane. His large print of 42nd Street, he said, I wasn't really happy with it when it was called the Great Divide. And so I cropped the plate, I took this out, I took that out, I moved around this, I took that figure, moved them over here. And um, he very generously gave me pictures of his state proofs put in the book. And it, it's really, it's seamless. It's, it's amazing what he can do. I haven't seen this since, the, you know, 18th century. Wow. Yeah. Did you hear that, Fred? <laughs> <laughs> You're next. You're next, Fred. <laughs> yeah. I think I can find you. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, he's, he's wonderful. We have a hook. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Conrad is our, the, our local print dealer and who you work with. And he's always telling me about how great Fred is and everything. And every time he says it, I'm like, oh, I should just say, Conrad, please hook me up. And I haven't. But now Carol will. <laughs> yeah, no, um, you know, and, and Conrad is great. He's so knowledgeable about prints and he's so, you know, he doesn't push them on you or anything. He's just, he's, he's a great dealer and honest as they come is great. And I'm also very grateful. I've, I've been very lucky with dealers. You know, I mean, Stone and Press, what they did for a contemporary mezzotint, for me, when the book first came out, Earl Retief went through the book and said, okay, well, let's, you know, show these artists. And, you know, it was always a big highlight of the print fair to see all these new mezzotints and affordable, affordable prints. 
That was devastating when Hurricane Katrina screwed that up for me. Oh, was that that year? <laughs> I sat around for a week making potholders, which is oh what I God. do, those little loons, you know, when I'm stressed, you know, watching the news like, oh, <laughs> I'm going to have to get a job at Walmart. You know? <laughs> I, we've been talking for more than two hours, so I'm thinking maybe we ought to oh, wrap really? it up. What do you all think? <laughs> I'm, I'm the only worried. reason I would say we have to is because I didn't know how to excuse myself to go to the restroom. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to put be right back. <laughs> well, it's been fun. I, I don't know. You know, of course, I'll kick myself later. What have I left out? You know, every time I see your, your podcasts, when you guys are talking... I, I want to jump into the conversation. So, like, this was my first chance to do that. Um, but I thank you very much for that opportunity. It was a blast, let me tell you. Let's figure out another way we can do one more together about something arcane like the Liber Studiorum. Oh, yeah, yeah. But thank you very much. This has been fun. Carol, thank you so much for coming on Play Mark and talking to us about not only Mazatin, but your own work. It's been really, really great. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Plate Mark, the conclusion of our conversation with Carol Wax. If you missed the first half, you should go back and listen to that. I should have said that at the top. I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> uh, thank you to Carol for being such a wonderful guest and for being a, an undying advocate for the art of mezzotint, which is one of my favorite things. Also, a thank you to True Ludwig for coming on the call with us. You're always a joy to talk to. A thank you, as usual, to Michael Diamond for the use of his original music, and one also to Dan Fury for the help with sound editing and uh, any other issues I run into, because you know what? I just, I'm not a sound person. <laughs> okay, let's see. What else? Oh, if you appreciate the content that we are producing at Plate Mark, please consider supporting us and becoming a monthly subscriber. You can do that by going over to platemarkpodcast.com and hitting the support and donate button, and it will lead you through the system. Also, over there, you'll find images that we talk about on the pod. And also, I don't know if you know this, but these episodes are available over on YouTube. And if you haven't found them, you get to watch us talk <laughs> on video. And I intersperse the images as we go through the conversation. So maybe, maybe try that out. All right. We'll see you next time.